بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, I wanted to say hello and welcome to everyone um, welcome to everyone here and then everyone uh, listening or watching online welcome to Zaytuna College for the second lecture in our faculty lecture series اقرأ was the first word revealed to our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Iqra, meaning read or recite, established the centrality of reading in particular and seeking knowledge in general in our tradition. Therefore, it's imperative that in our community, when we think of, of the place we are as Muslims in America right now, it's imperative for us to be conscious about our relationship to knowledge and our pursuit of knowledge. Towards that end, Zaytuna College is an important part of this story of Islam in America. And so we're asking for everyone's support. First, with your prayers, please keep us in your du'as. Second, with your financial support, such as joining us on February 18th for the benefit dinner with all three co-founders in San Jose. And third, by spreading the word about Zaytuna, considering applying or telling others about applying, and although the application deadline has passed, we're still accepting late applications. As for today, the title of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's lecture is How to Read a Book, which alludes to a book written in 1940 by Mortimer Adler. The suggestion for this lecture came from students, and so we'd like to thank them for that suggestion, and we'd like to say to everyone else, um, we hope that this can provide a step for allowing us to work together as Muslims in America, thinking consciously about our relationship to knowledge and building institutions of knowledge here in America. And finally, may God allow all of us to benefit from everything that is going to follow in this talk. Without further ado, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum to everybody in the data sphere. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-Ali al-Azim Allahumma iftah alayna hikmatak wa anshar alayna rahmatak ya adhan al-Jalali wa al-Kiram wa salillahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi al-Kiram wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah Alhamdulillah, it's good to see everybody um, it's been, I've been Absent. I actually haven't been well either, so I request everybody's dua, inshallah. Um, the topic, inshallah, I'm going to uh, discuss tonight is actually taken from a book uh, which uh, I was fortunate enough to actually have studied with uh, Dr. Adler in seminars, and he was a friend of my father's. Uh, and my father had studied with one of his mentors who actually taught him how to read a book. Uh, and that was Mark Van Doren, who was my father's teacher at Columbia for my father's duration at that university. And uh, Van Doren used to teach a course uh, using great books or classic literature. And out of that came a group of intellectuals in the United States that adopted uh, a certain program that they believe would help revive liberal arts colleges. But one of the things that they uh, recognized, and Adler wrote this book for this reason, is that most people do not really know how to read very well. We learn uh, abecedarian reading, which is basically how to read uh, letters on a book. We can read a, open up a book and, and, and read words. But to actually become a really good reader, a solid reader, is uh, a set of skills that that are acquired over actually a long period of time. And one of the things about uh, our tradition in particular, it it's really is a tradition that is rooted in, in reading. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu first revelation was Iqra, is read. And, and he was told, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, read in the name of your Lord. And the ba there, uh, bismi, in the name of, 
is what the Arab grammarians term ba al isti'ana. It's, it's the ba that you use, the instrumental ba. In other words, it's the means by which you uh, to read. And so there's, a, there's really a mystical component to reading that is hinted or alluded to in the, in the first revelation of Islam, that there is a type of reading that is done that is not the reading that the Prophet ﷺ was referring to when he said, Ma ana biqari, I'm not a reader. So the Prophet ﷺ was talking about uh, this type of just reading a book, abecedarian reading. And the, uh, what Adler refers to in this book as really plumbing the depths of a book, he, he talks about comprehensive reading. He talks about elementary reading is one type of reading, and then informational reading. And then he talks about comprehensive reading, which is reading for insight, for understanding. And, and that is really at the root of Islam. It's really getting to insight and understanding. And so uh, this, this book actually, I think, is, is really one of the most important books uh, that I've seen in the English language because it's a key to other books. It, it really can help you read other books. And it was written by somebody who, who learned how to read from a master reader. And uh, the Adler talks about when he first started teaching at Columbia, uh, he, he took a course with John Erskine, who was a very famous uh, philosopher. And it was a really extraordinary course. It was an honors course. They read two years. Uh, they read 60 great books in two years. So they'd read a book a week, and then they would come together and discuss it. And these were all really advanced students. And he was convinced that this was, he said, it wasn't that I discovered uh, gold, it's that I actually owned the, the mine. That he really felt that he had just uh, take, taken possession of this incredible treasure, which was all of this knowledge that had been passed down through the ages. And this radically changed his, uh, his perspective on learning. And he felt that the best way to really learn at the college level was through discussion. It was, not, it was through reading texts and really discussing them. But what happens is he, he became, when he graduated, he actually became a teacher of that course. And he thought, oh, I've done this course. I know all these books, and I'm ready to go. But being, he said, the diligent uh, teacher that he was, he decided to read each of the books again a second time, even though he was convinced that he knew them. And he said he was dumbstruck because when he read them again, it felt like he'd never read them before. And this is one of the hallmarks of a really, really good book, is that the, the more you read it, the more you get out of it. It's not, you don't just read a really great book one time. And Adler argues really that any book worth reading has to be read three times. But he does say that the book can be, by a master reader, they can learn how to do all three readings in one reading. But generally it's going to take one or two readings. Now one of the things that I think a lot of students uh, just assume is, one, if they don't understand something, they'll just ask the teacher. Right? So if I don't understand something, I can just ask the teacher, what, what does that mean? And that's a type of intellectual laziness when you are grappling with something because the fact that you don't understand it is either one of two things. It's so beyond your grasp that you just don't have access to it. So for instance, if you're not trained in mathematics and you pick up a book on physics, it's just not going to benefit you because you don't have the prerequisites for, for studying that book. But the other possibility is that you haven't given it enough thought. You haven't put the time in. Now I'll give you an example. The Metaphysics, which is considered one of the more difficult books, probably the most difficult book in Aristotle's uh, Companion of Writings. Uh, the Metaphysics, Ma Wara Tabi'a in Arabic, was, was translated into Arabic. Ibn Sina, the great scholar, philosopher, said that he had read the book 50 times and still couldn't get it. And he had pretty much given up hope on it. And he said he went to a store and this, <laughs> this scholar, this uh, bookseller said, I have a book that I think you'll really like. And it was an introduction to the 
the terms that Aristotle was using in the metaphysics. And Ibn Sina just told him, no, no, I don't want that book. I, I just, I've spent enough time on that book. He said, no, no, you should really, this is an amazing book and you should really, he said, no, no, I don't want it. And so the man said, look, you can have it as a gift. So he gave the man the book. Well, Ibn Sina went home and he decided to read the book. And that book was the key that unlocked the metaphysics for him. So sometimes a book needs prerequisites to get to it, right? He had tried to understand it, but he didn't have the tools necessary to understand the book. Most of the books that you see in our tradition, if you take a book, for instance, like uh, Tuhfat al ahwali which is a commentary on Imam al-Tirmidhi, if you take a book like that, the hadith pretty much assumes one thing. The Prophet ﷺ assumes one thing when he's, when he's speaking, that you understand the Arabic of the seventh century because he was speaking to the most intelligent, literate people and he was speaking to the most common people of his uh, peninsula. And he said, We're a, an unlettered community, meaning his first community. We don't read and we don't calculate. So everything that he said, according to Imam al-Shatabi, was meant to be understood by the average Arab of that time, who was illiterate. Now, when we look at the language, we can see how far we've fallen as a, as a species, because the Arabic language of the seventh century was the pinnacle, just like in our culture, uh, it's been argued that the, the English language reached its pinnacle in the uh, late, 16th, early 17th century, with people like Shakespeare, the committee that translated the King James Bible, people like John Donne, uh, Milton. I mean, this is where English reaches its pinnacle. And very often, it's the poets, and I, because I just mentioned three poets that represent the pinnacle of the English language. Very often, it's the poets that achieve uh, that... Uh, supremacy over other generations in terms of language and, and certainly in Islam it was no different because in the seventh century Arabic had reached its pinnacle with the Jahili poets and that's when revelation comes as a crown on that vast body of language that existed but it was because they had such extraordinary language skills and they were able to understand poetry and if you can understand poetry in any language you can understand anything written in that language I'm talking about good poetry. And that's why poetry is so important to study. Because one of the things that poets do, poets, um, people, you know, people that have very literal type minds, they say, why doesn't he just say what he means? You know, why is the poet, why does he talk in, in metaphors? Why does he talk in this uh, ambiguous language? Because when you study poems, you know, like two rows diverge in a wood and I, right? Well, what does he mean two rows diverge in a yellow wood? Like, what's he mean two rows diverge in a wood? Is he really talking about being on a path, walking down a Vermont uh, bucolic scene and he comes off two roads in a yellow wood and, and there he is, sorry, I could not travel both. You know, so he's there kind of wishing he could go down both. Is that really what he's talking about? Or is he talking about something deeper, right? And there's different ways that you can read things. You can read them at a literal level. And that would be he just came on two paths in a wood and it's fall probably because the, the th everything's yellow and the leaves are falling because he talks about the leaves uh, on the path. So maybe, maybe that's one level. That's a level of reading called the literal level. So basically... You know, when, you, when, when you look at this incredible tradition of scholarship, and, and I was using the example of that book, authors, the Prophet said when he spoke, his prerequisite is that you understand 7th century Arabic well. And, and if you do, you can understand what he's saying. Ad-Din nasiha There's a reason why he said Ad-Din as opposed to uh, Dinun. Or there's a reason why he said ad -dinu. He didn't say uh, he could have said adinu nasihatun, adinu nasiha, but he used uh, article of definition 
for both the mubtada and the khabar, right? For the, the subject and the predicate in that sentence. Why? There's a reason. And if you know, you don't have to know grammar to understand that. If you know Arabic in the way that the 7th century Jahli Arabs knew it, because they would know exactly what it meant. That was their language. And so language, the prerequisite for understanding uh, oral communication is simply the skills that we have in, in, uh, in language. And, and the, but they're very complicated. I mean, even the most aboriginal languages are incredibly complex. Doesn't matter how simple language gets, it's always complex. And it's a miracle that children learn how to speak, just syntax and how they work out, and then generative grammar, how they generate grammar. Because children will say things that they've, that they've never heard said before. They'll start formulating sentences at three, four years old, and they've never heard those sentences before, but they're generating language. So humans are language generators. We naturally generate language. Now, at a certain point, people started writing down. Allah says we taught by the pen and because the loh and mahfuz is one of the really profound images in the Islamic tradition this idea of the loh and the qalam that God made this tablet and then he made a pen and he told the pen to write on the tablet so everything that is was and ever will be was actually written down according to this narrative so there's a reading, and then on Yom Qiyamah, what do you do? You read your sahifa. You're given your book, and you're told to read it. Iqra kitab. You have to read your actions. Everything that you did, it's all recorded. Kitabun marqum. In, in some kind of, uh, who knows what, I mean, you know, that modern language marqum means digital. You know, ruqam is digit, but it could also mean written. A written book or a digital book, Allahu alam. But it's a book that recorded everything. And we know that we've got scriveners, angelic scriveners that are writing things down, right? Taking notes. So reading is central to the Islamic tradition. It's all about reading. And then reading signs in the self and on the horizon. So if you look when... When, when, when the Prophet Sallallahu was told to read, and he said, I don't know how to read, he said, no, read, again, I don't know how to read, read, this is a different type of reading, it's a deeper type of reading. And then we're told, and this is very interesting because even though semiotics is, there's, it's an ancient concept, the idea of the, the, the simos, you know, the symbols, it's, it's an ancient concept, I and mean, the Greeks talked about it, but the fact that one of the most important uh, areas of philosophical pursuit is in this whole area of semiotics and signs and symbols and meanings. And the fact that the Quran identifies itself as a book of signs. And signs are to be interpreted. You have to know what a sign, you have to be able to read a sign in order for that sign to be meaningful for you. If you don't read the sign, uh, it's of no benefit. If you, if you come and, and there's a sign that says danger, uh, cliff ahead, sharp turn, and, and, and you speak Russian and the sign's in Arabic, and you go off the cliff, it's because you couldn't read that sign. But if, if you saw the sign, you read the sign in a language you understood, you'd save yourself from the, from the danger of possible destruction or destruction itself. So reading is, is it's just foundational. Now, if you look, one of the things he points out if you look, one of the first and most important things, there are many types of reading, but basically there are three fundamental things that people read for. One is amusement. Uh, less so today than ever before. Traditionally, people uh, read for amusement as a pastime, and you would often see um, uh, people just on trains or before that even, just sitting with a book. Uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau talks about meeting a farmer in Massachusetts out near Concord uh, where he was staying near Walden Pond uh, who was plowing a field and he had Homer's Iliad in his pocket in Greek and then he would, when he would take 
time to rest, he would sit down and he would read Homer's Iliad. And Thoreau said, you know, I started discussing it with him because at that time, uh, Massachusetts had about a 98% literacy rate. They've never achieved that before. And one of the things they studied in grammar schools was Latin and Greek. So here's a farmer, peasant farmer, who's reading Homeric Greek, which is, it's, it's difficult Greek. It's, it's uh, you know, there's three, there's four Greeks. There's, there's Homeric, there's Attic Greek, which is the Greek of uh, Plato. And then you have Koine Greek, which is New Testament Greek. And now you have modern Greek. And each one is a very distinct language. The Homeric is really the most uh, uh, vast um, in terms of vocabulary, just like Jahili Arabic. It's much vaster than what comes after. I mean, the Quran reduces the vocabulary considerably because the Quran was meant to be understood by lots and lots of people. So the actual number of words in the Quran are far less than exist in the Arabic language. Um, and there's no really difficult words in the Quran. And it's very I interesting. The Quran uses very uh, easy to grasp terms. There's what they call ghrib al-Quran, but generally it's not, it's not difficult Arabic in that way. So he, he meets this, and he said, you know, when he started discussing it, he really didn't have an idea of the, the themes of the book, but he just thought it was the greatest yarn he'd ever read, this yeoman. You know, he's, he's reading it for amusement. Now, Socrates quotes Homer a lot for edification, like he uses him as a source of wisdom. And it could be argued that the whole foundation of Greek civilization is Homer, is the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? But you could read the Iliad purely for amusement. It's just a great yarn for somebody. Now, that people read like People magazine. You know, you see people reading People and self, and us, right? All these, you know, it used to be life. Now it's self, right? Um, so they read these, and, and these are kind of these opiate magazines out there. Just everybody just reads them, and they're kind of meaningless tripe, and there's, there's nothing really in them. They're, they're, you're not going to be edified to find out that uh, so-and-so's got bulimia, or so-and-so's getting a divorce, or... You know, Angelina is upset with, uh, what's the other one? Ray. No, the girl that, Jennifer. Jennifer, there you go. See, we know all these things because it's in your face everywhere, right? You can't go to, the, you go to the supermarket. My mom's 90 and she was at the supermarket and there was an old lady with her. I mean, she's not old for my mom because she was probably only around 75. My mom says old is 10 years, whatever you are, older than whatever you are. So for my mom, 100 is old now. But, you know, this older lady looks at my mom. They're, they're looking at all the magazines on that rack, you know, National Enquirer and Spectator, whatever they are, people. And she just looked at my mom and she said, aren't you glad we're on the way out? <laughs> so what's interesting is if you look at somebody like, uh, you know, like um, Dorothy Sayer. I mean, she was lamenting how bad it was in the 1940s. I mean, I, they could only, uh, I mean, I think they would just drop dead by what they see now. But that's one type of reading. Then you have informational reading, like Time or Newsweek, just to get some information, like what's happening in Iraq, you know, or what's happening with the Republican uh, race, things like that. So you get type of information. And that is readily, it's easy to read. It's not that hard if you're, educated. I mean, they're, they're writing probably at about 7th or 8th grade level. I mean, that's it. Most books now, according to, you know, a friend of mine who uh, was asked to write a book for a major publisher was asked, at what level do you want? He said, generally the books that we publish now are at a 6th grade level. If you look at, uh, according to, uh, you know, studies of the language of debates, Kennedy's and Nixon's debates were at about 11th grade level of, uh, of, of understanding, high school. Uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates were at graduate school level. Right? If you just analyze the language and, and, and the type of level they, they were speaking, now it's about 5th to 6th grade level. That's what they're talking at. So this is a kind of dumbing down, but people, you know, that's the, the level that information is being written on. 
the, the last reason to read is, is to learn something, for understanding, what he calls comprehensive reading. It's, it's actually for, to, to illuminate you, you know, your understanding. Now what's interesting is one of the things that, that uh, Adler argues is he says that you know, people will say, oh, I can't read that book, it's over my head. And he said that is the very reason why you should read it. Because if you always read things that are at your level, you will never improve yourself. You, you won't get any through. But when you read something that's over your head, it forces you to like pull-ups, right? The bar's over your head. And so as you pull up, right, it's really hard at first, but if you keep trying, it gets easier and easier. You can do more and more. Now, one of the things St. Augustine said about his education, and he was educated in what are called now, in our, in our tradition, uh, the liberal arts. Even though most liberal arts majors cannot, if you ask them what are the liberal arts, they won't be able to tell you. Even though they have a bachelor's in the liberal arts or a master's in the liberal arts, they won't be able to tell you actually what they, what they refer to. But uh, Augustine wrote a book called, it's, it's not really a book, but it's, it's an essay on, on Christian doctrine in which he argues that it was essential for people to know these language arts before they went into the Bible to understand it. And, and, and he identifies them as grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And what he said by mastering these arts, he said he was able to read, that he was able to understand anything that he read and to articulate anything he thought. I mean, that's the definition of a literate person, that they can, they can understand what they read and they can articulate what they think because a lot of people can't articulate their thoughts. You know, I wish I could put it into words, what I'm trying to say, but they don't have that. that that's a skill. Some people have it more naturally than others, but it is a skill that can be acquired. It's, it's not magic. You have to have words. You have to know how words are put together. And so, basically, the, the, what he says is he wrote this book for that third type of reading. He didn't read it for those first two. He said, if you're interested in those types of reading, don't bother with this book. You're just wasting your time. And so what he says is the first thing he talks about reading, the word itself. You have to know words because one of the things, one of the real problems with language is that we simply assume because we learn language as children. You know, we heard our parents say things in context and we worked it out. We worked out what words mean in context. But words are very, many words are ambiguous. You have in logic something called an amphiboly, which is where you have double entendres, things, syntax that can actually mean different things, even though it's set, said the same way. Sometimes it's written, and sometimes it's how you speak it, right? Like, if, you know, in America you have the right to bear arms, right? What does that mean? You, you can have a weapon. And some people could think what you meant was you have the right to take off your shirt and show your arms, right? Because in some cultures, women don't have the right to bear arms. <laughs> like in Saudi Arabia, it's, it's illegal for a woman to bear her arms. Right? So there's an example you know, of something that's just, the language is not clear. Now that's a, that's a kind of humorous example, but people actually misunderstand language all the time for that reason. And you have a whole set of fallacies in logic called the fallacies of uh, equivocation, which is where Things can mean more than one thing. We're using a term to mean different things. You know, uh, to give me an example, you could say that uh, you know uh, uh, only men are rational animals, right? Does everybody agree with that statement? Generally, I mean, jinn are rational and, and angels are rational, but we'll just you know it, some people don't really accept those other categories. So we'll just say all all men are rational animals. You accept that, Mahasan? Yeah. Okay, women are not men. Therefore, women are not rational animals, right? Does that sound reasoning? Yeah, okay, good. See, the, the equivocal term there is men because in the first term, it's a universal term that includes women. But in, in the conclusion, I'm basically excluding 
men, uh, women from men. So I'm using a term, right, ambiguously, which is one of the rules in logic that you cannot do. Terms have to be unambiguous. So what he says is you have to know the words that the author is using and how he's using them. And that's very important. So reading, what does reading mean? Like reading, what does it mean? I'm not reading you, Fatima. You know, I don't, what does that mean? I'm not reading you. I don't know what you mean, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't, know, I don't know where you're coming from. I'm not reading you, right? Or, um, you know what, Mahasan, you're, you're reading between the lines here, right? I mean, we can use the word in a lot of different ways, right? But, and, and so there's a basic meaning, which is just to read. But if you actually look, one of the meanings in Old English for read is the fourth stomach of a ruminant, right? Because ruminants have four stomachs. And what do ruminants do? They chew the cud, right? And they swallow it, and then what do they do? They spit it back up, chew it some more, swallow it, spit it back up, chew it some more. So isn't it interesting that our word to read and to ruminate, to ponder things, has to do with this idea of chewing. You know, Bacon said that some books are to be tasted, some books are to be swallowed, and some books are to be chewed and digested. Right? So the idea that reading is is something that it's not just this superficial thing here even in our language and 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 that's one of the beauties of of a dictionary of etymology you see because you can really get you know Heidegger who's a German philosopher said language is the house of being what do you think he meant by that language is the house of being I mean first of all what's being how's he using that term being is a term. What is being? Existence. existence, right? Everything that is, right, has existence. That's being. Like this. So metaphysics is the study of being, right? So when he says language is the house of being, what's he mean? What, what happens in a house? You live in it, right? You know, you live in your house. It's where you spend your time. So for us as conscientious beings, right, because we're, the, we're, we're really, out of all these other animals that are out there, we're the ones that are thinking about what's going to happen to, you know, my retirement plan. You know, there's no birds worrying about their 401ks. They're not. They're not out there. There's no lizards that are like, oh my God, the economy is so depressed. You know, what am I going to do? You know, right? They're, they're not out there. Be, but because we can actually think about things, you know, cogitate, think about the future, worry about the future. Like, we, we, language is where all this experience is, 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 is residing. Right? It's residing in our language. And he felt that if you could get back, he believed Greek was the you know, the essential language. If you could get back to these ancient terms from the Greeks, you could really understand the name, like if you could really get to the meaning of philos and agape and eros, terms that dealt with love, because there's different types of love. The Greeks distinguish. The Arabs distinguish. We don't really distinguish. We have to use adjectives to differentiate between our types of love. But other languages actually have different words for different types of love, because they recognize they're not the same. So one of the really uh, important things to have when you're reading seriously is if you're reading a great writer, because great writers, they differ from other writers in that they're very specific about the words they use. You know? And when you get into poetry, it's even more so because poets are not only using words based on their meanings, but they're using words based on their sounds. Like in English, we have mutes and liquids. Do you know mutes and liquids? Like k is a mute. Because a, a mute sound, you, you have to have a vowel to complete it. Right? So you have a word like stop, p, p. You know, the p is a mute sound. So, you know, if a poet uses a mute as opposed to a liquid, he's doing it for effect, or she is doing it for effect. So just learning the sounds of words, of why we would choose stone over rock. 
And they're very different sounds, aren't they? Stones, stepping stone. We don't say stepping rocks, right? But a stone is a rock, and a rock is a type of stone, right? Or, but when we think of rock, it's a very different thing of stone, right? So poets will even be more specific. But great writers always use words very specifically. They, they're not sloppy in that way. And that's why modern writers, you know, I had a teacher, a Mortanian, who said the difference between the ancients and the moderns is ancients wrote a sentence that could be commented on in a book. He said moderns write books that could be summed up in a sentence. Right? It's very different. Uh, and, and, and I found that to be very true. Most of the books that I read by modern writers, they really could be summed up very briefly. Whereas if you read a book like Qawaid al-Tasawwuf, you can't sum that book up by Ahmed Zarruq. Couldn't sum it up? Very difficult to do that. So it's important to have a dictionary and then a good etymological dictionary to deal with terms. So now let me just look at some of the things that uh, he says in here. Um, and then I'm going to do a poem with you. I'm going to actually do this in two classes because uh, the book can't be, like, you know, it's, there's a lot in here. And I, and I want you all to read this if you haven't already read it. And if you can, I would get the first edition. You have to buy it used. The problem is if you all buy it at once, it shoots up in price because used books, now they've got the computers, so they're very aware of movement with a book. Right, suddenly it's like $7 and it shoots up to 99 because they're limited. But the 1940, the first edition is, I think, uh, much better. I've read both of them. I had to read the Van Doren version in college. Uh, but this one, uh, I think, is a much better uh, edition. But one of the things that he argues in here uh, at the outset, he talks about reading... Um, and then he talks about reading is learning. And he says that there's no such thing as passive reading. You can't read passively. There's only more active reading. But reading is, a, is, a, is an activity. Watching a film can be completely passive because you're just a, you're, you're, you're receptive. And it can stimulate you, you know, you can, uh, at the emotional level. Some films can stimulate you intellectually. I mean, some films, a film like Red Beard by Kurosawa is... I think as edifying as a lot of books, you know, in just terms of, uh, and, and great film directors um, are, are do, you know, they have a purpose in making their films. They're not making their films simply to entertain, although that's one level that the film could be, uh, could be taken on. But one of the things that he says in here um, is that he, he realized after he'd gotten his degree that he was actually a poor reader. This already, he's got his PhD, and he was put into this class to teach. And he said that he, he'd read these books again, and he realized he hadn't really read them the first time. He thought he had. And then he was teaching in this seminar with uh, Van Doren. And what happened was, he said he started reading commentaries and encyclopedia articles about the books. And so he would come, like, thinking he was really prepared. But he said most of the good students had already done that. So, and he said what would happen is they would end up discussing things about the book, but they weren't discussing the book. And, and he said what really, he, and, and he's very humble in that he, he mentions that it was, it was a great blessing for him to have been uh, exposed. Um, He says, fortunately for me, I was found out, or else I might have been satisfied with getting by as a teacher just as I had got by as a student. If I had succeeded in fooling others, I might soon have deceived myself as well. My first good fortune was in having a colleague in his teaching, Mark Van Doren, the poet. He led off in the discussion of poetry, as I was supposed to do in the case of history, science, and philosophy. He was several years my senior, probably more honest than I am, certainly a better reader. Forced to compare my performance with him, I simply could not fool myself. I had not found out what the books contained by reading them, but by reading about them. So he realized he really hadn't read these books because 
And this is why textbooks, you see, the reason that you study textbooks, do you know why you study textbooks? You know why they, other than the money that the textbook industry makes because you can't copyright old books, other than the money they make. And that's why they change them every year. They have new, even though no new information, they just change them so they make money. But you know why you read textbooks? You don't know. Anybody? It's basically so-called experts that have read the original books in that field and they summarize the knowledge for you. It's digest knowledge. So what they're saying is you're too stupid you know, to, really, to, to read original source material. So we're going to give you this dumbed down version. And, but what's happened consistently over time is they keep having to be more and more dumb. Because they've never, they're not challenging people. And so people become lazier and lazier to the point that basically what you're reading is tertiary, you know, thought about something. And you're reading it in a, in a prose that is prosaic at best. It's bad. It's just bad. There's no voice, right? I mean, if you're used to good literature, Rashida, you've read good literature, right? How, how do you feel about textbooks? It's torture, isn't it? I can't read textbooks. I, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't read them. Because they're so, you know, it's like some guy that memorized Strunk and White and practiced every single rule in that book, you know. And so technically, you know, there's no grammatical mistakes generally because they're well edited and everything. But there's no voice. There's no, whereas if you read, who would you rather read in grammar? You know, uh, Ahmed Fouda some guy from Egypt who was born in 1970? Uh, or would you rather read uh, Ibn Hisham, one of the greatest grammarians that ever lived? I mean, who would you rather read? Seriously. Who would you rather read about, uh, you know, the philosophy of history? Some guy who read Ibn Khaldun? Or would you rather read Ibn Khaldun? Because Ibn Khaldun's not that hard. I've read him. I know he's not that hard, right? So, so you know, that's one of the things about having, forcing yourself to read these books and not read what other people say about these books. You read them for yourselves and, and you learn how to read them. And so you have to learn certain skills to read these books. And then this is what he goes. Now the other thing he talks about is dead and living teachers. And he says that in reality the dead teachers aren't dead teachers. You know in this culture they talk about dead white men. You know that phrase? which is not really fair to these people because they, they, they act as if somehow these dead white men are the reason for all this. You know, there's this kind of let's get rid of dead white men because the, the, all the problems came from these dead white men. The fact is this civilization has consistently ignored most of those dead white men. I mean, it, this civilization has happened in spite of them because many of them were persecuted, literally killed, Right? They weren't popular people. Spinoza was kicked out. Right? They weren't popular people. Locke had to flee England from political persecution. Right? Socrates was killed by the noble people of Athens. <laughs> but we have dead brown men. Right? That's our tradition. We've got this whole tradition of, I mean, this is largely written. We don't have that many women that wrote. We do have some women that wrote. In Kitab al-Ghani, there were many female scholars, but female, the women tended to be, you know, you have to have a certain type of uh, jara'a in Arabic, like a bravado to write a book, because writing a book is putting, it's really, not only is it putting yourself on the line, but it, it's also, there's a certain assumption that you're, qualified to do something and the women tended to be very humble. It wasn't that they weren't great scholars. They had a lot of great scholars, but their nature was more humble in that. So it wasn't that there weren't great women scholars. There were, but they tended not to write. And a lot of them focused on areas like Sira, Hadith, great muhaddithat, several of them. But and some of the fuqaha, uh, Imam al-Tahawi's mother, Umm um, uh, um al-Tahawi, uh, was one of the great fuqaha quoted in the books of fiqh of the Shafi'i school. But generally, you're looking at a, a, a tradition that was largely written uh, by men. And, and that's something to take into consideration critically when you read, because men have a certain view that women don't always have. The Prophet ﷺ used to take counsel from the women, listen to the women. 
he would have the women come. They had khatibatun nisa. She used to come, make, make uh, declarations on the women's behalf. And the Prophet would force the Sahaba to listen to her. And then he'd ask, what do you think? And they would all be, well, it's amazing. You know, because they weren't used to having that voice. So, but he talks about dead and living teachers. And one of the things he says is that reading a book is like reading nature. Um, the questions you ask, you have to answer yourself. When you ask questions of a book, you have to answer them yourself. Whereas in a lecture, you can stop me and say, what did you mean by that? And I can explain it to you. Right? So a living teacher is very beneficial in that they can really help you to understand some things. So uh, and he talks about, you know, long before the magazine existed, live teachers earned their living by being readers' digests. Right? In other words, a, a lot of what teachers and lecturers did is that they learned all these things and then they were able to transmit them to other students. But in the end, the work, you have to do the work. All right, what time is it? Okay, so what I'm going to do uh, right now is, uh, this is just part one of this uh, lecture. Um, but I'll go over quickly... Um, you know, he, he, he said that, that there's, there's three basic uh, ways of reading a book that's worth reading. And he talks about, um, you know, that you have to read it structurally, which is, he uses the metaphor of architecture, which is a good metaphor. So you, what, you, what, you, what you understand is the architecture of the book, because any great book is written with a structure in mind. If you read Imam al-Ghazali's book, The Ihya, the Ihya has extraordinary structure, and he articulates it early on in the book. If you look at it, he has 40 books. There's a reason why he put, what's book 20 in the Ihya? Do you know? Does anybody know book 20? Nope. What's book 20? Nobody? Book 20 is the book of the prophet's character. So... He puts that right at the heart of the book. Right? Out of 40 books, he puts it right at the heart because that's the heart of that, that, that whole opus. Well, what he's saying is, here's the embodiment of everything that I'm talking about. All these virtues, all these qualities that I'm telling you to inculcate, this is the one you should emulate in them. But he's got 10, four books. So he does quartet. And there's a reason why he has a quartet. I mean, there's a reason why we have four movements in... Uh, in music as well. Four is a very interesting number, and they were very interested in uh, numbers. There's four amzija, right? The mizaj. There's four. There's four uh, uh, seasons, right? So four is very important in the life of man because we have four basic seasons in our lives. We have our childhood, we have our, uh, you know, adulthood, maturity, and then we have our uh, fall, right? And then you have your winter your last period. And so he puts these in the four, and then he's got the first is the Book of Knowledge. That's where he starts, because he's going to define for you. This is Ihya Ulum ad -deen. But before I'm going to show you how to revive these sciences, I have to tell you what the ilm is. Because this is a book about knowledge. So I'm going to define my terms. Right? So he's got, it's a very structured book. So you have to look at the structure of a book. Now, some books are very uh, nice in that they give you what are called analytical chapter summaries. So you have like a chapter heading and then you have the analytical summary. So the, the author is telling you here, this is what this chapter is about. You'll get that. But you should be doing that work. You have to really break down a chapter, right? So looking at the structure of it. And then you have to look also, the, the second type is the analytical, the interpretive where you really have to see what the author is saying, what's going on, right? And then finally, a critical reading, which is where you begin to engage in a, in a, these are the three types that he said every book has to be read three times. The first is to get the structure, the second is to understand the book, and the third is to have a conversation with the book. And you can only, he said a lot of people will jump to the third reading. They'll read it critically without really understanding it. And, th and, th and that's where you get people, oh, that book, it's rubbish. Why? Oh, because, you know, the author's full of it. You know, whatever. 
but have they really understood the author's positions? Because uh, in a lot of cases, they haven't. You know, there's people that are entrenched in ideological position. If I'm a Keynesian, any monetarist that I read, I'm just going to disagree with him off the bat. But if I don't have a position economically, maybe I'm a Keynesian, but I'm open to persuasion. You know, persuade me that monetarist policies are better than Keynesian. Or maybe there's a third way. Maybe, the, you know, there's some synthesis out of this dialectic. Or maybe, you know, there's a fourth, a fifth, or a sixth way. Maybe we can think outside of the box, right? But if I'm entrenched in a certain ideological viewpoint, there's no way I'm going to be able to read a, a book with an open mind. So that's one of the things, suspend, suspending your criticism, charitable reading, all right? So uh, basically what I want to do now before we end uh, is I want to look at that poem. So could everybody... Uh, read. This is a poem by Piercy Bysshe Shelley because reading poems are like reading a book in miniature. You know, a poem is really like a book, all right, because it's so packed with meaning. Poets are, in, you know, you could write, I could write a whole book, and I'm not exaggerating, I could write a book comment, uh, com commenting on this poem. I, I guarantee you, I know I could. I could write a book just commenting on this poem. That's how much meaning I consider to be in this poem. This is the reason I like this poem. It was the first poem when I was 12 years old. I was in uh, uh, 13. I was 13 years old in eighth grade, Mrs. Augustinelli's class. She was my English teacher. And I read this poem, and it gave me goosebumps. It's the first poem that ever really affected me like that. Right? So for me, it has a lot of meaning in that way. But anyway, some people, you know, He's from the Romantics, Percy Bysshe Shelley, famous for marrying the woman that wrote a famous novel, right? Frankenstein. Anyway, these guys were very critical of, uh, of a lot of things. Um, but so just read it and just, just give you a, a minute or two. Just read it and uh, think about it. Do you have a coffee? Yeah. So, if you had to say in one word what the poem, what kind of, what you felt reading that poem, what would it be? <laughs> That's like, yeah. I guess if you hyphenated them, we could consider them one word. Uh, yeah, well, okay, why? What, what's the feeling? What did you feel? Had you, have you read it before? No. no, so it's the first time you ever read it. Yeah. Okay, it's a famous poem. So what did you feel? Overwhelmed. Yeah. It was, it was just like so much meaning in every single line that it was like overwhelming. And what most struck you about it? How, uh, I think it's kind of random, but at the same time it was just, I, I, I couldn't put 
I don't know what was the main point, but okay. like every single line was the main point. Okay. Can anybody identify what you think the main point is? Rashida, what's, what do you think the main point is in here? It's, it's definitely a very ironic poem. Yeah. And what's the central irony? That Ozymandias um, basically can't touch justice. It's pretty much pronounced greater than anything. Yeah. What's left of him is just broken down to his bones. Yeah, it's in the middle of these, yeah. There's nothing there around the decay, right? That colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sand stretch far away. Yeah. So, I met a traveler from an antique land who said to vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. That's the quotation. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. So it's definitely an ironic poem. Now, if you get into, what, are there any words that other, Ozymandias is actually a real name, because this was, you know, this was during the British when they were beginning to uh, discover Egypt, and they were coming back, they were actually bringing things back as well, but they were discovering, and, and so they were telling, they had these travel logs, it was very popular to read about their experiences going up the, uh, the Nile and seeing all these incredible Egyptian ruins of the pharaohs and became very, in, in England, it was a big deal. And so he's writing this poem about somebody who's come back and he's telling him about his experience, right? And, and he's going to tell him about this, he was out in the desert, right? And then he saw this two vast and trunkless legs of stone, right? Trunkless legs of stone. <laughs> it's amazing, you know, trunkless, like there's no body. Just the legs of stone are there, right? S stand in the desert, right? They're standing there without a trunk, right? Near them, and then nearby on the sand, half sunk. I mean, another really strong, and you know, you can see the trunk sunk. You see, these are the internal rhymes of the poem. I mean, these, are, these, are, these are, you know, he could have said other, he could have described half buried, he could have said, right? But he didn't. He said half sunk. A shattered visage lies. And sunk is something we normally think of the sea, right? Something sinks in, the, in water. But here's sand. There's another type of water. The water of earth. Right? Half sunk. A shattered visage. Right? What's a visage? It's the face, right? And, and this is important because, you know, th that's an older word we don't know. So you have to know why he's using a visage, right? lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. What's he telling us about this guy? His character, right? Tell that it's sculptor well those passions read, right? The sculptor really understood something about this, this character, right? Whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. I mean, sneer, it's an interesting word, right? What does sneer mean? What do you do when you sneer at somebody? Arrogant. It's contemptuous, right? Arrogance, just sneering. Right? Sneer of cold command. Heartless. We're dealing with a heartless person here. Tell that its sculptor well those passions read. 
I mean, here we have reading, right? The artist reads also. It's a different type of reading. He's reading into the personality of the, uh, of the, of the character that he's sculpting. He read well those passions because he's put them on that face. And then what's he telling us? Passions are, when you think of passion, what do you think of? Greeting. Huh? Greeting. Well, what do you think though? Passions. Like somebody's passionate, what are they? Huh? They love what doing. Yeah, but what? Yeah. Passion. He's got so much passion. Yeah, huh? I mean, I think of life, somebody who's really alive, you know, they're passionate, they're alive, right? So he's, it's interesting, he's juxtaposing here, you know, to tell that it's sculpted well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. So here he's juxtaposing passions with lifeless, and yet he's telling us they survive. How have they survived? The sculpture, you see, so this is Shelley's own little we're getting into his philosophy now because Shelley was a romantic and believed that in the immortality of art, that art was one way of achieving immortality. And so what he's saying is, look, Ozymandias doesn't really live anymore except because of this artist, right? So the artist actually outlived Ozymandias because he's the one that left behind this thing. It wasn't Ozymandias. He paid for it, but it was the artist that produced it, right? So he's tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mock them what do you think he means there mock them and the heart that fed what does he mean the hand that mocked them what does mocked mean what's mock mean there's another poem, great poem, one of my favorite poems by Ye Yeats. Come let us mock at the great that had such burdens on the mind and toiled so hard and late to leave some monument behind nor thought of the leveling wind. Come let us mock at the good with all those calendars. Come let us mock at the good with all those calendars whereon they fixed old aching eyes nor thought of, of how the seasons run and now but gape at the sun. Come, let us mock at the wise that fancied goodness might be gay and sick of solitude might proclaim a holiday. Wind shrieked, and where are they? Mock mockers after that. Who would not lift a hand, maybe, to bar that foul storm out? Who would not lift a hand, maybe, to help the good, wise, or great to bow that foul storm out? For we traffic in mockery. Right? He's talking about the modern age. It's all mockery. Let's just make fun of everybody. Make fun of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu You know, it's just, it's an age of mockery. Make fun. Everybody's open game. Make fun of politicians. Make fun of, everybody's open game for mockery. But, but is that what he's saying here? The hand that mocked them? See, this is important. So I'm knowing terms. Yeah, that's what he means. He, he means more imitate. Because that, uh, you know, in his time, mock also meant to copy or to imitate. The hand that copied them. Because he wasn't mocking. He wasn't mocking Ozymandias. So this is important. You can't understand something unless you know the words that the author is using in it. So here he means the hand that copied them. Now what's he mean the heart that fed? The passions. Yeah, he copied those passions. He, got, he nailed them. He got them on that face in stone. Right? The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. What's the heart that fed? Fed what? The passion. So it's the heart of Ozymandias. He got his heart. It's, it's a cold heart. It's a contemptuous heart. It's a heart that, you know, it's, it's, it looks down, it frowns on things, not, not a happy heart. And on the pedestal, these words appear. I mean, what do we put up on pedestals, right? On the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. You know, you'll never be able to achieve what I achieve. Despair, mighty. He's talking to the mighty. He's not talking to the peasants. 
He's talking to other kings. I'm king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty. Not peasants. You know, they're all shaking in their boots. I'm talking about the mighty should look at me and who I am. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. And then, boom, he's got the exclamation mark, right? And then what? Nothing beside remains. <laughs> Just such a beautiful turn of phrase to come right after that. You know, nothing beside remains. That's it. Right? Round the decay of that colossal wreck. Right? This giant Ozymandias. Nothing beside remains. Round the, the, the decay of that colossal wreck. Boundless and bare the level sands, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So what's he mean, boundless and bare? The lone and level sands stretch far away. What are the sands referring to? It's the desert, right? But what, what do you think, what do we think of sands also? The sands of time, right? So it's time, it levels everything. Everything we build, it's all going to be leveled. Time is the great leveler. So, you know, he's basically just saying, look, nothing beside remains. It's all boundless and bare. The lone and level sands just stretch far away. There's just this little half-sunk visage in the midst of a massive ocean called time that no matter what we do, it's always going to be this half-sunk, shattered visage in the ocean of time, the sands of time, right, in the end. Pretty bleak. Unless, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا فِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَارِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالصَّبْرِ Unless people are building not for this world. <laughs> because all these things that you do here become meanings in the next world. Everything you do here is, is meaningful in the next world. That's another view. Anyway. So, any questions, any answers? There's definitely some questions. On the, okay, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Muhammad uh, Rizal asks, can you ask Sheikh Hamza what he thinks of speed reading? Yeah, um, speed reading is like trying to read on methamphetamines. I don't believe in speed reading. I think you can speed read um, a blog, not my blogs. <laughs> you can speed read a blog. You can speed read a, a, an article in Time or Newsweek, something like that. You know, there's things you could read. There, there's, there's skimming and then there's superficial reading. Skimming is just scrolling down a page and, you know, trying to see, do I really want to read this or not? And then superficial reading is to read it without really thinking about it. Right? Whereas real reading takes time. I mean, real readers are, uh, you know, if you're going to read something in the way he's talking about, Adler recommends not reading more than 20 pages an hour and taking a break. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's slow reading. So, you know, but I mean, I, you know, my teachers, like Sheikh Abdullah bin Bey, he reads all the time. Amazing. He always takes books with him. And, and Marab Tarhaj, I brought him once a three volume book of Al Wazani as a gift. It was a book of fatwas that he didn't have, and it's a famous one. It's quoted. He just, for the next three weeks, that's all he read when he had free time. And he finished it in like three weeks. Mind you, he's reading something that he knows a lot about. So it depends on also what you're reading. Uh, Adler talks about you know original communication, which are our primary texts, because there's authors that that are giving you original thought, and most books don't have a lot of original thought in them because it's just not very few humans have really original things to say, and a lot of them are actually just rehashing things that have already been said, but because people don't know tradition, you know Mark Twain said the ancients stole all their best ideas from us. Right? I mean, there's a lot of truth to that statement, you know, because people don't know where things come from. And so they, they read something and they think, wow, that's amazing. But then you read Aristotle and you'll see like, oh, that's where he got it from, you know. 
So that happens. Um, anyway, so I mean, I'm not a, I, yeah, I took a speed reading course in school that I had to take in, when I was in school, and maybe I didn't have to take it, but I think I did actually, because it was in a, it was part of, for because I was a tutor when I was in school in the reading lab. Um, but I, I wouldn't recommend speed reading. I'm not a fast reader. I should read really slow. I look up words too. Like I don't. If I don't know a word, I, I'll, I'll look it up, which slows you down. You know. I mean, I have a, a pretty good vocabulary, but you know, there's words I still come across words all the time that I, I either don't know or I'm not quite sure or I can't remember. You know, it's like because you have passive and active vocabulary. Active vocabulary is what you use. Passive is what you can recognize and understand when you hear it or read it. And our passive vocabularies are much larger than our active vocabularies. I mean, our active vocabularies are usually limited to about two or 3,000 words, but, but uh, our passive, but act, uh, I mean active. Our passive ones, you know, you're talking a lot of words. People, people know a lot of words, surprisingly. I mean, even, you know, relatively uneducated people know a lot of words and also a lot of nuances. And I mean, what the average person knows is just phenomenal. That's why people are brilliant. Humans are, we're not stupid. We're very smart, you know, and memory, people say, I don't have a good memory, rubbish. And you, you remember so many things, it's amazing. You can all leave this room and, and I can ask you to tell me basically what's in this room and you remember it. I mean, how did that happen? It's from being in a room to know, you know, where the podium was, you know, where the books were, approximately how many of those shelves are in here. You know where the table was. Where you know we can we can describe those kiosks, the little uh, cubicles in the thing, right? We and there's a little guest book on the thing, right? And then I saw a little poster. You can go there now if it's still there. You know, a little poster about building Zaytuna brick by brick. I mean, I was just walking into a room and I noticed all these things. I mean, how did that get stuck in there? People have phenomenal memories. We just don't know how to utilize our memories. Like we don't know how to read. These things are trained. You know, memory is a, you train your memory. It's, it's, it's a skill. So, anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Um, one of our students who is joining us online uh, says, in regards to reading higher level books and primary sources, isn't it helpful to rely on something that is a little easier to understand as a means of gaining familiarity with the material? and then heading into more difficult original texts. Otherwise, it would seem to be a barrier to learning if an individual becomes overwhelmed or give up. Thanks. You know, I would say it depends on what you're reading. I mean, for instance, you know, I'm reading a book right now that I've read before, but I'm reading it um, with somebody, and uh, it's a book by Imam al Bajuri. And Imam al Bajuri assumes in that book and it's, a, it's really a secondary book because he's drawing from a lot of different books. But, and it's a textbook. It was used in Al-Azhar for Aqidah. But in that book, he's assuming that you know uh, logic, rhetoric, grammar, philology, ilm uh, al um, uh, He's assuming that you know uh, theology because it's an intermediate theology book. So he's assuming you've had basic theology. So he makes all these assumptions on his reader. Now, if you knew Arabic pretty well, you could actually read the book, but you would be missing a lot of his nuances. You just, you just would. And then you'll miss things like he'll use a word that you won't know that he's using it to refer to something else, a, a science as a technical term, because that's one of the things about knowing terms. Now, one of the things that he's going to argue in here is that you have to also, in, in the second level of reading, you have to be able to identify terms and propositions and arguments. And these are basically the three subjects of logic, understanding, judgment, and reasoning. Those are the three subjects that logic deals with. Understanding is what are called simple apprehensions, knowing terms, what's called in, in Arabic logic, tasawwur, being able to conceptualize something. And the Arabs say, uh, 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 they say that al-hukmu ala shay'in far'un an tasawwurihi. 
in order to judge something, uh, judging a thing is a branch of its conceptualization. You have to conceptualize something before you can make a proposition. So you have to know, if I say all men are created equal, okay, I have to know what men, all men, that's a universal statement, so I mean every man. Does that include black people? At a certain time, maybe people wouldn't have agreed that, right? But now most people, right, would include that. Does that include, you know, Arabs? Does that include, right? So when we say all men, we're talking about everybody, right? Irrespective of what people went 200 years ago when, when they declared that. They didn't think that that was a universal statement. Jefferson did, right? And Benjamin Rush and others, but not all of them. I mean, I'm sure they, they didn't. But you make that same, you have to know what they mean by all men. And then what do they mean created equal? Equal is a mathematical term, and they're using it in a philosophical statement. So, I mean, are we equal? Like, you're taller than me, aren't you? Stand up. Yeah, I think so. He's taller than me, isn't he? So we're not equal. So all men are not created equal. He's taller than me, right? So what, am I, what do I mean by equal here? What am I talking about? You know, these are terms. You have to understand the terms before you can make the proposition. So is it a mathematical metaphor? Um, is it, w am I saying created is assuming God too, right? Because created means it's a passive form that assumes a creator, right? Because created means to be made. So something that was made has to have a maker. That's an assumption. And they believed it because they're and in, are endowed by their creator. They Mention the creator right after that, right? So that's a proposition. All men are created equal. Is it a true proposition? In modal logic, you have what are called modalities. So it depends on what you're talking about. You know, because people aren't created equal. Some people are faster than others, taller than others, smarter than others. We're not all created equal. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about with our basic human dignity? That's, so there's a proposition. Is that what he meant? Maybe. We need to discuss it. So you, you have to know the terms and then the proposition. Now, he's making an argument. That's a proposition. It's a categorical statement, right? It's a declarative statement. All men are created equal. He's not saying maybe all men are created equal. I think all men are created equal. In my opinion, all men are created equal. Those are different ways of saying it. He's saying all men are created equal. Categorical, declarative, universal statement. We have to know what those terms are, and then we have to know, okay, what's his reasoning? What's his reasoning? What, so, so now that's the third level. So that is, th that's a science that, inshallah, you guys are going to learn before you get out of here, because it's very important. You know, one of the things about logic is no longer taught, generally, and it's, it's created a lot of havoc because people can't think anymore, clearly. And, and our tradition is very committed to logic. I mean, the Shamsiya was a, almost a universal, uh, you know, the Sulam in North Africa. I mean, one of the things about Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya that makes him distinct amongst a lot of scholars I've seen is he really knows logic really well. So when he, when he reasons, he's just, it's like knowing chess. Logic's like knowing chess, but y you know, you don't just know the rules, because everybody, we can all reason. I mean, we're humans. Like, everybody can, you can make an argument, you can make an argument. People make arguments all the time. But when that's, there's a difference between knowing the rules of chess and knowing the strategies of chess, right? Because if you know the strategies of chess, you can end a chess match in about three or four moves with somebody who doesn't know the strategies of chess. And, and logic is not simply to win arguments. It's, it's really a, a means, a tool to pursue the truth. And, and that's why, you know, that's one of the things he says, that you should not uh, ever want to read a book critically just to win an argument with the author. No, you should be open to being convinced. Imam Shafi'i said, I never debated anybody, but I hoped and prayed that the truth would manifest on his tongue, so I would have to submit to it. And that's a whole other way of looking at this thing. But he's assuming that, you know, traditionally people study grammar, rhetoric, logic. They understood conditional sentences. They understood universals, particulars. They understood um, definitions, amphibolies, uh, equivocations. All these type of things are really important in language. And they're all things, they're tools of learning that, that you need to acquire. And, and the better you get at them, the better you'll be at at reading, and the better you'll be at critical reading. Because one of the things about all these men, that one of the things that they share, if you go into any of these books, like Imam Sawi, 
you know, wrote this book as a commentary on his sheikh's book. You know, he is going to assume that you understand, um, you know, logic. I mean, he's just going to assume it. And he's going to assume that you understand, mm, you know, وَقَوْرُهُ أَيَ الْكَثِيرِ كما فسر ابن الفرحون معنى الغالب وقيل معنى الغالب أي في إطلاق لفظ الجيد عليه كما فسر به الباجي you know so now he's defining what's he mean by الكثير وحمر في الجيد على الغالب منه في البرد وحمر في الرديع على الغالب أي الكثير منه في البرد وإلا يغلب شيء فالوسط من الجيد ومن الردي يقضي به so these are all terms that you have to understand, he's talking about jayid of, of food stuff, the good of a food stuff, right? And the radi is the lower quality. Ala al ghalib, ay al kathir minhu fil balad, the majority of it in a country, illa yagrib al shay, fad wasat min al jayid, o min al radi yuqdabi. So you can also use what's between the two. And then he goes further into the commentary. Al kathir here, according to Ibn Farhun, means the same, al ghalib. And some say it means the, as fi ittaq lafz al jayyid It's the ghalib of the jayyid only. So, you know, he, these are like, this is like a telegraph. I mean, he's using, you know, it's like, it's like texting. He's using minimal language there. And that's the way the later writers are. The earlier writers are much easier to read. But they're just, they, they kept distilling it, distilling it, distilling it, right? Because here, see, in... When, when he wrote this book, this is a sixth volume. When he wrote this book, it was assumed that you memorize the text. This is a commentary on a text that's about 150 pages. And he assumed you memorize the text. And then what, what the commentary is, is those are for the text to be memory pegs for the meanings. But this book is a condensation of another book, which is called the Mudawana, right? which I should be here somewhere. Mm. Anyway, so the Modowana is like about this size. So they took the Modowana and took it down to about this size. So they took a book like this and summarized it to this and then had to write this to explain it. So you're back where you started. But the reason they did that was because in the old days they actually memorized this. And they couldn't do that anymore. So they started writing these abridgments to keep the memory, you know, to, to simplify it. So even though it was much smaller, it was actually a lot harder than this. But the memory was easier. And so this was just to explain what you had memorized because people couldn't memorize that anymore. So that's the way the Muslim tradition kind of got into these summaries and glosses and glosses on glosses and went like that. But they're assuming at this level, he's writing in the 200 years ago, he's, he's assuming that you have mastered a certain set of sciences. He, and he's not writing for some guy that's got a secondary degree from you know, a high school or, or even a college degree now at Ein Shams or at Damascus University. They can't read these books. You, know, th you have to study people you have to study with people who have studied the books. And that's why the ulama say, and, that, and he talks about that. He said some books you need a teacher. They're just not going to work without a teacher. He says if it's a great book generally it should be understandable. It's a lot harder with a teacher, uh, without a teacher. But he said you can do it if you put the work in it. And, that, and that's true. But I'll, I'll conclude, sorry about, I know there's a lot of questions, but I'll conclude Abu Hayyan al-Tawheedi one of the great scholars of uh, Islam, he said, that, that simple people think, you know, inexperienced people think that books will lead the, the one of intellect to understanding. You'll come to know these knowledges, right? حيرت عقل الفهيم وما يدري الجهول بأن فيها غوامض حيرت عقل الفهيم but the ignoramus doesn't know 
that in these books are ambiguities that will confuse even the most intelligent of people. إِذَا رُمْتَ الْعُلُومَ بِغَيْرِ شَيْخٍ ضَلَلْتَ عَنَ السِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ وَتَلْتَبِسُ الْأُمُورُ عَلَيْكَ حَتَّى تَسِيرَ أَضَلْنَ مِنْ تُومَ الْحَكِيمِ If you try to learn the, the, this knowledge, you know, revelation and the knowledges that go with it, if you try to learn this without a teacher, you will go astray. And affairs will become so confusing to you that you'll be more astray than Thomas the physician. And it's referring to a famous Arabic tradition of Toma al-Hakim. He was a man who inherited books from his father. His father was a physician who died. He inherited his library. So he read and learned medicine through books. And he had a book that said, Al-Habbatu Sauda, Dawa'un min kulli da. The black seed is a cure for every disease. But there were two dots. The, 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 the scrivener put two dots instead of one on Habba. So it said, Al-Hayatu Sauda. The black snake is a cure for every disease. So he went to find a black snake and they call it black mamba. It's a very poisonous snake. And he tried to catch it and it bit him and he died. So they, that's their metaphor for <laughs> Anyway, subhanakallah wa hamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan. So I'm going to do the next one. Will be, it'll be a continuation on this, but I'm going to go into f uh, more detail and, uh, and we'll do uh, some more poems and. Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to read with you a, a speech to analyze as well. All right? Barakallah fikum. Harun, shukran. Oh. Bismillah. Sorry, it's just uh, it's very hard, obviously, to follow that. Um, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Hamza, for the uh, amazing... Um, intellectual journey we just went on. Jazakumullah khair, everyone, for being here. Please, everyone, consider joining us here at Zaytuna for the intellectual journeys that happen here and for supporting this. Um, and please see the website and, uh, and the Facebook page for information about the next lecture. Jazakumullah khair. Zaytuna College is investing in a new home in Berkeley, California. Join us on February 18th for a benefit dinner featuring Zaid Shakir, Hamza Yusuf, and Hatem Bazian, and find out how you can dedicate a brick to be permanently displayed at the new campus. Register today.